Amen. Good morning. This morning we're going to shift gears a little bit. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount now for the past three weeks, and now we're going to switch gears. We're going to be moving on to other parts of the Gospels. Uh, but before we move on, I was thinking about Jerry's sermon last week about how we were supposed to not judge others in a condemning way. Uh, we have to make decisions and judgments all the time, uh, but we don't want to judge people the way that God does. And that led me to a shocking realization. There is one biblical character who should have been around to hear Jerry's sermon last week and really take it to heart. You know who it is? It's Joshua. Now, why would I say Joshua needed to hear Jerry's sermon last week? Because Joshua judges Ruth. And you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to judge other people. So anyway, there's your groaner for the morning. <laughs> Let's move on. All right, this morning's question comes from a section of healings in the book of Matthew. So here is our, our verse for the day. When he, Jesus, entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. So we're going to be talking about healing today. We're going to be talking about faith today. And we're going to be talking about the relationship between faith and healing. And I don't know where you stand on all of that right now. I know that I no longer exactly agree with the relationship that I was taught between healing and faith growing up. And so I want to make some observations this morning and hopefully expand uh, your, question, your understanding of healing. But I think there's simple beauty in recognizing this this morning. The question before us this morning is not, uh, why doesn't everyone get healed or get healed immediately? The question is not, what are the conditions for healing? The question is not, do you expect to be healed or do you not expect to be healed? Those are not the questions that we have before us. The question is, do you believe that Jesus is able to heal? And I love how simple this question is. Uh, there, there's something else I want to point out. We're going to come back to it here at the end of the sermon. Uh, I think we all know in our heads what's the right answer, right? Uh, he, the pastor puts a question up on the screen. It's pretty obvious yes answer, right? We know up here that the answer is yes. But sometimes I think where we feel here, what we think here may be a different answer. It might be a maybe or it might be a I don't know, right? And so I want to acknowledge that and make space for that today as well. Because sometimes our hearts do struggle to answer that way because we know people who are not receiving healing. Maybe we personally uh, are waiting for healing in a category of life. Um, and so we're going to be talking about these types of thoughts, these type, this type of phenomenon as well. How we know what the right answer is, but sometimes we don't feel the right answer. So let's go through the record and the context surrounding this question. I'm not going to read the whole thing, there's a whole bunch of healings, but we're going to circle back to a couple of those healings later in the series. So I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder in the future. But we'll pick it up in Matthew 9, verse 27. And as Jesus passed on from there, from some other healings he had just done, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, so Jesus entered the house, uh, likely the house in Capernaum where he was staying, uh, Matthew 4 references that house, but anyway, he, so he's, he's in private. He's not in public. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. Uh, I'll talk about this briefly here because we're not going to talk, we're, we're going to talk mostly about verses 29 to 27 this morning, but I wanted to read a couple more of these verses to give you a flavor for what happens after because I think there's some interesting things that happen here. Uh, the sea that no one knows about it is probably what's called the messianic secret, which is Jesus knew that the more openly and publicly he healed people, people would start to realize that he was the Messiah. And if he gets called out as the Messiah too early, then everyone puts pressure on him and eventually the Romans would kill him too early. He knows that what he's doing is dangerous. Even though he's not taking up swords and he's trying to fight, he's not trying to fight the Romans. But even the healing stuff and the delivering people stuff was enough of bringing that kingdom power into manifestation that people would have started to realize that this guy is the Messiah. And so that's why he tells people sometimes, don't, don't talk about this. Don't talk about this. Uh, the other thing is he wanted to be able to move freely and do what he needed to do. And if, and if people would share that information, he'd start to get 
stopped everywhere. People would want to bother him everywhere he went to. So there's sort of multiple levels here to what he's saying. But verse 31, they went away and spread his fame throughout all that district. So they, they did not obey, unfortunately. Verse 32, now as they were going away, behold, a demon oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. So here he's got another healing that he does. This time it, it wasn't, he didn't lay hands on them. He cast out a spirit. So here is another healing in the immediate context where the, the thing that he did, the type of healing it was, there was a different mode. And uh, so anyway, there was deliverance there. Verse 34, but the Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Um, I think this is interesting because uh, oftentimes we see in the Gospels that there are multiple responses that people have to these types of miracles. Some people immediately believe and agree and are like, yes, Jesus is a prophet or he is the Messiah. Some people are like, well, this is strange that this happened, but I'm not so sure yet. And then some people go into, yes, there's power, but it's not the good power, right? So here the leaders don't uh, doubt the power, they just doubt the source. I think that's interesting. But this is what, verse 35, it shows me what Jesus continued to do throughout all of this, throughout all the, all the stuff that he's doing, all the healings he's doing. This is what he was doing. Verse 35, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And again, you know, this whole idea of proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, this time when everything wrong with the world is made right again, he wasn't just teaching about it, he was also demonstrating what it would look like by healing people, by casting out spirits, by delivering people from the different things that they were dealing with. And so uh, it's really cool to me that he is, he's just walking around, um, not just teaching this abstract concept of what the future is going to look like, but he's embodying it as he, as he steps uh, through uh, the various cities and villages where he was traveling. So now, again, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the record. We're going to focus in on the first three verses. And again, we didn't read the context uh, before this, but Jesus has just healed a few other people. He's just raised a young woman from the dead. And he's leaving the scene where he raised the young lady from the dead, and two blind men follow him. So back to the beginning, verse 27. And as Jesus passed on from there, from raising this young woman from the dead, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. I want you to notice what these two blind men say to Jesus. The first thing that they do is they ask Jesus for what? For mercy. They ask him for mercy. They understood that physical healing was an act of mercy. But I also want you to notice what they call Jesus. They don't just call him Jesus. They don't call him, you know, this or that. They call him the son of David. And this is a loaded title to be giving. It's not one that you would just throw around to a random person. It's not like I would walk up to you on the street and be like, oh, looks like you're a son of David. You know, that's not how they did that. This is a reference to the Davidic covenant, the time when God promised David that one of his sons, one of his ancestors would rule on his throne forever as king. And so they're calling him that son of David. They're calling him the Messiah. They're calling him this figure that was prophesied about in 2 Samuel 7. So I think we should, immediately as we're jumping into this record, and like I said, verse 27 is the beginning of this, this specific healing context. The first thing that can arrest our attention is that these men are physically blind, but they perceive something about Jesus that not many people do, spiritually. They perceive clearly who Jesus is. They recognize Jesus as their king, as their Messiah. Verse 28. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. So again, Jesus is no longer on the roads of Galilee. He has returned to the house that he is staying in. And again, it's likely the one that is mentioned in Matthew 4, verse 13, uh, where he's, it says he was staying in Capernaum. So these two blind men... They recognize who Jesus was. They've been asking him for mercy. They come to him. They don't stop with following him on the road. They follow him all the way to this house. They continue pressing in and asking him for mercy, for this healing. Now, Jesus asks them the question, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they answer it simply, yes, Lord, we do. 
I want to pause here for a minute because I think that this is a central feature of this particular healing as opposed to many of the other healings in the Bible. And we're going to look at a couple of examples later. But in many cases of healing that we can observe in the Bible, we can see someone's faith in the context of their healing. Uh, various people come to Jesus and that act of coming to Jesus is an act of faith. Um, or people, uh, you know, the, they have to go through crowds and they're dealing with certain illnesses and that's an act of faith, right? So we can observe, or the centurion earlier in the Gospel of Matthew says, if you just say the word, I know my servant's going to be healed. Jesus perceived his faith because of what he said, right? So we can perceive faith in a lot of these contexts, in a lot of these healings. But this is one of the few, and it's perhaps the only one in the book of Matthew where Jesus asks a question like this, do you believe that I am able to do this? As if it's like a condition or something to this healing taking place. So I thought it was really interesting what uh, Dr. R.T. France said in his commentary. And I want to read that to you right now. He said, faith has been mentioned as a key factor in previous healings, but this is the first time when it is explicitly set before the su suppliant as a condition of healing. The centurion voluntarily declared his faith in Jesus' authority to heal. That's in chapter 8, verses 8 to 10. So also the leper in 8.2, the official in 9.18, and secretly the woman in 9.21. But these men are required to do so. There is no obvious reason why this additional element should be present in this case, since it does not occur in the similar story of the healing of blind men in chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. So I think this is really fascinating that Jesus asks this question. He doesn't ask it of anyone else. He asks it of these blind men who, I mean, just think about blind men in the ancient world. It's not like blind men could just travel wherever they wanted to go, especially if they're trying to follow another person. They would have had to have help, probably, following Jesus from the crowds and the things that he was doing back to his house. It's not like that's an easy thing for blind men to do. So they've already followed him. They've been calling on him as they've been following him. And Jesus still asks them this question. I think this is a, a, a fascinating situation. So I think there are two questions that we should answer this morning as we consider this record. What is the faith that these men displayed? And what role does faith have in healing more generally? So we're going to start with the first one. What, what is the faith that these men displayed? And again, I want to say that I, I know that I had misunderstandings about the word faith growing up. I attached a lot of things to the biblical idea of faith that didn't actually belong. So I want to strip some of those things away for us this morning and just teach very simply what faith is. So what is faith? In its simplest form, what is faith? Faith is trust. That's probably an easier English word for us to use. Faith is such a loaded theological term these days, but think about trust. And the easiest example that I can use of trust is a chair. Here's a picture of a chair. Uh, all of you are sitting in chairs right now. Now, how many of you, you don't have to show your hands if you don't want to, but how many of you doubted whether the chair would hold you when you sat down this morning. Anyone doubt? Oh, <laughs> Zach, nice. <laughs> there are chairs in the world that would cause us concern. This one uh, should cause us concern, I think, for a couple of reasons. I don't know how well you can see the picture on the screen, but there are some weird gaps in the back there that look a little sketchy to me. Uh, but probably the most problematic thing about this particular chair is it's in the middle of a road. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to sit in that chair, even if it could hold me, for a period of time, I'm not sure I'd want to sit there for any period of time because I might be concerned a car would come along. So anyway, the idea is pretty simple. Some chairs are wobbly. Maybe the wood is cracking or splitting or falling apart. And you're like, I don't know if I want to sit there and mess with that chair, right? Uh, or this one, it's in a dangerous spot. Um, you know, these types of chairs are not worthy of our trust, right? We're not going to sit in those types of chairs. But the chairs like we have here in the synagogue, you probably didn't think twice about sitting down in those chairs. Um, so that's trust. That's faith. You had faith that the chair would hold you. And I know it's very, very basic example, very simple example, but I think it's a good one. So when we talk about biblical faith, we are talking about trust. Who do we trust? Why do we trust them? And in the context of this particular record, Jesus asked the blind men to trust his ability and by implication, his authority to heal them. And they say, yes, we believe that you can heal us. This faith directly impacted their healing. 
We know this by verse 29. Verse 29 says, after they say affirmative, yes, Lord, we believe, he says, then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. So how did these men display their faith? Was it simply in saying yes when Jesus asked them the question? Is that the first time that their faith shows up in this record? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. No, these men intentionally sought out Jesus. They, they had heard about the different things that he had been doing. And like I said, making your way as a blind man in an ancient, in any culture, even in modern culture, but in an ancient culture especially, would have been difficult. And so they have to hear that there's this miracle worker, this healer, this prophet who's going around whose name is Jesus. They have to hear about Jesus and they have to say, well, maybe Jesus would take care of our blindness, right? So then they get together and they, they decide, we're going to go seek this guy out. We're two blind guys. We're going to get the help we need. We're going to seek this guy out. So then they seek him out. Then they find him after these healings that he's already done. Then they follow him to this house, you know, and again, I'm, I'm presuming they have people leading them by the hands probably this whole time. So their faith is being demonstrated at all these different points along the way. And so then when they find Jesus, they pay him respect and they ask him directly for healing. So I think, I think they're pretty locked in. <laughs> they're pretty locked in that Jesus can do this the whole time. And so I really find it interesting that Jesus asked them the question that he did because it seems pretty clear to me that they did believe that he could heal them. But my point is, their trust in Jesus, it wasn't like an overnight thing. It wasn't like there's these two random blind guys, they're on the road, and then boom, they get healed, right? They just hear about Jesus, immediately believe, he asks the question, boom, they're good. I, this process takes time. Building faith, building trust takes time. And it's obvious in the way that they acted, that they had faith, that they had trust in Jesus. That leads us to the second question for us this morning, which is, what role does faith have in healing more generally? So it, it's hard to read a record like this and say that there's nothing to do between faith and healing. I mean, literally, Jesus just told us they received healing because of their faith, right? There is some relationship here between faith and healing. But what is it? Well, when I was younger, I was taught that since God has the ability to heal and God always wants to heal, that the only limiting factor would be my personal faith. Now, I don't... Uh, take this to be the most biblical perspective anymore. I don't think it's the most helpful way to look at healing um, in general. And to understand why I don't, I want to get a little nerdy for, with you for just one moment. So if you'll forgive me, we're going to get nerdy for just a moment. There are two types of conditions in logic. There's something called a necessary condition, and there's something called a sufficient condition. Now, a necessary condition is just one of several conditions that may be true to make another statement true. So for example, on the board here, I've got the statement, I have a son named Liam. Now that statement, I have a son named Liam, it's only true if I, I first have to have a son, right? If I don't have a son, then I can't have a son named Liam, right? So having a son is what's called a necessary condition. But that son also must have a name. It's not, you know, if the son is just born, and he doesn't have a name yet, then I can't say I have a son named, I can say I have a son, but I can't say I have a son named Liam, right? So they have to have a name, and then that name has to be what? Liam. They have to have the name Liam, right? So that's, those are the three necessary conditions. I have to have a son, he has to be named, and he has to be named Liam. See how there's three necessary conditions for the statement, I have a son named Liam, to be true. Now, a sufficient condition is something that automatically makes another thing true. For example, if I say Charles is king, then we already know that Charles is a man. That, that is enough information to know that Charles is a man. I know things have gotten weird in modern society, but I'm still going to go there. Uh, if Charles is king, that implies that he is biologically male. He is a man. So, what I was taught growing up about faith is that faith was a sufficient condition for healing. What that means is, irrespective of any other conditions, if my faith was strong enough, then I would be guaranteed to be healed. And I don't believe that that's true. I believe faith is a necessary condition, but I do not believe that it is sufficient. And I think we'll start to see why I believe this. I'm going to use an analogy to help us out with this. I know I'm throwing a lot of nerdy stuff at you, but let's, let's take an example. Imagine you're baking a cake. Um, I would love to say that during COVID is when I developed my 
uh, baking hobby, but really it was before COVID when I developed my baking hobby. I wanted to find a hobby that I could do uh, with the kids, and my pr previous hobbies had all been like golf, where I leave my family for a whole day at a time, right? And that's something that, as you have younger kids, it's not something you can do as much. So I was like, I need to find a hobby that I can do with the kids. And we all like sweet treats, right? So we started doing some baking. We got a stand mixer and all that stuff. So imagine you're baking a cake. Baking a cake requires basically the same ingredients. It doesn't matter what kind of cake you're baking. It, it always requires the same ingredients. It requires flour. It requires eggs. It requires a fat, which is usually butter, sugar, salt, milk, and a leavening, a leavening agent of some kind, like baking soda or something like that. So I want, to I want you to imagine for a minute you're, you're trying to bake a cake. All of those ingredients we can understand are what I would call necessary ingredients. They're necessary conditions for baking a cake, right? So now you have the nicest, the most expensive, the best refined cake flour on the planet. If you have that, but you have none of the other ingredients, can you make a cake? If you have the nicest flour, the, the most extravagant, expensive flour in the world, can you bake a cake with just that flour? No. What would happen if you took a mound of that beautiful flour and you put it in a cake pan and you threw it in the oven? What would happen to it? You'd end up, <laughs> you'd end up with, a, with a mess of burnt flour. I asked Liam th this question earlier the week and he said, it'd be like a pile of burnt salt, you know? <laughs> He was thinking visually, you know, it, it would look like burned salt, you know. We, would all, we can all agree that if you just had, the, even though it was the best flour in the world, if you, ended, if you had a mound of flour, you put it into the oven and you tried to bake it, what, whatever's coming out of there is not a cake. It's not going to be edible. You're not going to like what it tastes like, right? You would not end up with a cake. Now, imagine that you have everything but the flour now. Can you still bake a cake? No, probably not. I mean, like, there are flourless recipes, and we'll talk about, we'll talk about, there is a, a faithless healing. There is a flourless cake example recipe in the Bible, which I'll show you. It's very rare. I'm going to say it's, it's, it's probably not impossible, but it's going to be very difficult to bake a cake without the flour. Now, there might be a recipe here or there that might be able to get you around the flour. Most cases, you're going to need to have a flour of one type or another. It might be gluten-free flour. It might be a little stale, but you need flour pretty much every single time. But herein lies the important point that I'm trying to make here, and that is there is no single recipe for healing in the Bible. There is no single recipe for healing in the Bible. If we want to think about every example of healing in the Bible as a different kind of cake, each recipe is different. There are a lot of the same elements that we can see, because to bake a cake, you need the same ingredients, right? But sometimes there's only a dash of salt. Sometimes there's more salt. Sometimes there's this kind of flour. Sometimes there's another type of flour. Sometimes there's this cocoa being added to the mix to make it a chocolate cake, right? So there's all these different ways to have healing, to see healing as it's been manifested throughout the different healing records in the Bible. There's not one single recipe that works every single time. And I just want to document this by two different slides. Each of them have five examples. Here are some healings in Matthew. You have the healing of the leper. Jesus touched the man and said, be clean. That's how he healed him. You have the centurion's servant. He was suffering from paralysis and he was suffering. And Jesus didn't touch that man. He didn't tell him to be clean. He didn't even talk to the guy. He talked to the centurion over him. Jesus spoke the word. The servant was healed. Do you notice how those recipes are different? <laughs> then you have the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. She was having a fever. Jesus touched her hand and the fever left her. He didn't tell her to be clean. She wasn't ceremonially unclean, but you get the point. Healing of the paralytic in Matthew 9. Jesus forgave his sins and told him to get up and walk. Did he forgive the other person's sins when he healed them? No. This is an ingredient that's different to this one. What about the man with the withered hand? The man with the withered hand, Jesus told him to stretch out his hand. And he was in a crowd of people. So some of these miracles were done in crowds of people, and they had to take action that would have been interesting in front of a group of like religious leaders and stuff like that, like the man with the withered hand. Some people didn't have to deal with that kind of potential shame or potential uh, difficulty. Think about how he's healed blind men throughout the Bible. 
uh, the record we just saw where he, he asks them if they have faith, then he touches their eyes. Here are four other healings of blind men in the Bible. So you have the healing of two blind, uh, the blind and mute man. Uh, Jesus cast out spirits so that he could talk and see. That's in Matthew 12. So here in our record, he just touches their eyes. It's a physical thing. They were healed. In that example, there was a spiritual component to it. So he cast out the spirit and then the guy could see again. These are two different recipes, right? You have the two blind men near Jericho. He touched their eyes and immediately they received their sight. But when the blind man at Bethsaida, he had to spit on the man's eyes. He put his hands on him. He still couldn't see clearly. He did it a second time. Then the man's sight was fully restored. Do you see how these are all different cakes? Do you see how these are all different recipes? Different, slightly different ingredients, slightly different ways it works out? Then the man born blind, Jesus made mud with his saliva. He didn't spit directly on the man's eyes. He made mud with his saliva. He put it on the man's eyes and then told him to go wash in this pool so he'd be clean. So these are all unique things. These are all different ways. And he's healing the same type of thing. So even when Jesus healed the same type of malady, he did it five different ways. And so that should arrest our attention that there's no one way to bake a cake in the Bible. There's no one recipe for healing in the Bible. Each cake is unique. Each cake is different. Now, again, most recipes are going to call for faith. Almost every single example of any healing in the Bible is going to call for faith in some proportion. Um, just like almost every single recipe for cake is going to call for flour, right? We know that to have a cake, you pretty much have to have flour. But sometimes the flour is a smaller ingredient. Sometimes the flour is different. There, there are all these different ways that it happened. And I know many of you are thinking about, when you think about like faithless healings in the Bible, the one that I thought of immediately was the man who brought his son. His son was demon-possessed. Uh, he kept uh, like falling into the fire and doing different things and, and basically trying to kill himself. And, and he gets brought to his disciples. The disciples can't do anything about it. So they bring the boy and the dad to Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, where's your faith at? And he says, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief, right? And then Jesus, you know, he, he heals it. This guy doesn't look like he had a ton of faith, but he was, Jesus was still able to heal the, uh, this man's kid. So that, to me, there's some faith there. He's trying. He's working towards it. I want to show you a flourless cake recipe in the Bible, a completely faithless healing in the Bible. This is cool uh, because in the record we're about to read, I want to um, give a little background here. The prophet Elisha was a great man of God. Uh, he was famous for miracles and for healings. And in the record we're about to read, this man, Elisha, has died and he's been buried. So Elisha's not around anymore. He's not here to heal anybody anymore. He's dead. He's decomposing. This is so cool. This is a record that my, my friend Sean Finnegan told me about. 2 Kings chapter 13. So Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. So we've got, we've got enemies of the people of God coming in and invading the land. Verse 21. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding bad band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. All right, so let's, let's picture what's going on here. This is as terse as it gets. We only get these two verses talking about this record, okay? So to set the scene here, a man has died. There are people, presumably this man's family, his friends. Uh, they're in the process of burying this man. As they go to bury this man, I don't know how they're carrying him, if he's on a pallet or how they did it in the ancient world. I'm not quite sure, but we can imagine that they're using something to carry him around, right? They're, not, they're trying not to touch the body. We know that they would have tried to avoid touching the body. That would have made them ceremonially unclean. So anyway, they're going to bury this man. They've probably got this pretty visible apparatus that they're using to carry him around a pallet of, of some, some kind, right? Now... As they're doing this, a band of enemies come in, guys with swords or, you know, whatever you can imagine, bows and arrows, whatever. They're coming in. You see this huge band of people coming in. Now, what's in your heart right now? Are you excited to see these people? <laughs> are you like, yay? No, you're, you're, are you feeling full of faith that God's going to protect you? No, you're probably afraid. Afraid that you're stuck here with this body, and now what's going to happen? We've got these guys coming in to attack us. 
what's going to happen to us? Now, instead of setting the dead man down, instead of just going on with the, I mean, they could have just gone on with the burial, I suppose, right? Like if they were just being really feeling really bold that day, maybe they'd be like, look, these guys are going to mess with us. We've got a dead body here. They're going to see what's going on. They're going to have respect for us or whatever. But they didn't do that. What they do instead, instead of just like setting the guy down, they decide, I guess maybe they don't want their friend to get, you know, his dead body to be desecrated by the Moabites or something. So anyway, they decide to just like talk, chuck this guy into the closest hole that they can find. That's what they did. They chucked this guy into this hole, this random grave. So I, I think it's fair to say that these men do not have faith. They certainly don't have faith for, the, for their buddy to be raised from the dead. They, they did not know where Elisha's grave was. It's not like they were seeking out Elisha's grave, and maybe if we touch the bones of a holy man, then our buddy's going to get up from the dead. Like, there's, there is no expectation here. There is no faith here. If anything, what they have is an excess of fear in their lives right now. They are afraid of the people coming after them. They chuck this body down in the closest hole that they can find, and what happens to this guy? <laughs> he pops up. <laughs> I mean, just picture this for a second. You've got a guy, you know, you can, we, we can have Bernie's around, you know. You, just, you got this dead guy, and then he just, like, tumbles to the ground. And then it's like, boop, he touches the bones, and then he's like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> you know? This isn't what I thought, you know, the kingdom would be like. This is what I thought paradise would look like. Huh? I've got some guy's bones right here, you know. It's just, to me, this is just so wild. It's just such a wild record. Um, so, anyway. Here's a, here's, a, here's a flourless cake recipe in the Bible. There's no faith here. Yet this man gets raised from the dead. So it's, it's just unbelievable to me. So, so what's the point I want to make with all this? The point I'm trying to make is our faith is not a sufficient condition for healing. It's not if you just have enough faith, then you'll be healed, or then you'll be healed the way that you expect to be healed or want to be healed. That's not how it goes. Faith is a necessary condition in almost every biblical healing we can look at, absent this one, uh, you know, there are flourless cake recipes. There is a faithless healing here in the Bible. Okay? It can happen. It's just not typical. Faith is often a necessary condition. So I want to ask the question here at the end, what are the other things that can help us to receive healing? Here are some possible conditions I, I want to put together. And, and some, of these, some of these are obvious and are there, are present in every healing. Some of these are present in some, obviously, and, and may not be as obvious or may not be as present in others. But here are some things. If you're looking for healing, here are some things that we should, we should think about. The first one is the power of God. power of God has to be present. That's, a, that's necessary. Every single time someone raised, raised from the dead, every time someone is healed in the Bible, power of God was there. All right. The will of God to heal you in that moment also there in every single healing. Those two, I think, are pretty obvious. The third one, faith or trust in God and in Jesus. And then there's usually actions uh, that correspond to that faith, actions that we do to respond in faith to that, showing that we have faith or trust in God or in Jesus. Um, and again, usually when it, we see these records in the Gospels, it's, we see their faith in the effort and the length that people took to get to Jesus. Because getting to Jesus wasn't always easy. There were crowds, there were other things going on, social situations and things like that. Another thing that's a condition is knowing that healing is possible. You have to have knowledge that healing is possible. Okay? So people in the world today, they don't often know that healing is possible. Just sharing that with them can change their disposition, can change um, the conditions for healing. Access to someone with a gifting in healing. This is such a big one. I mean, look at Jesus. Jesus had a remarkable healing ministry. Um, having access to Jesus in his earthly ministry, that is a huge condition for healing. Uh, the Bible frequently says that uh, everyone who came to Jesus to be healed was healed, every single person. That's because he had a special gifting in healing. I'm not saying that there aren't people like that today where, where you can go to them and generally speaking, they see healings, but I don't think they're going to see it like to the extent that Jesus did, right? But we can still... Uh, be thankful for God, for people in the body of Christ who do have a special gifting in healing. And that can be a condition that can help accelerate things. Uh, personal things that can help us receive healing. Uh, forgiving others uh, that have wronged you in the past. Um, if you look at different healing ministries online, this is a big one that people talk about. People that are gifted in healing will talk about forgiveness being a barrier sometimes to receiving healing. Uh, sometimes in the Bible says uh, that sometimes getting free from sins holding you back can help you with 
uh, receiving healing. We talked about that a couple of months ago in the uh, sermon on physical healing I did. We, we went to James and I showed you that one. And then the other thing that we always must do is have patience and humility as we wait for whatever healing is going to take place. So those are some conditions there for healing. As we close this morning, I want to go back to the question at hand. The question is, do you believe Jesus is able to heal? Do you believe that Jesus is able to heal? He asked the blind men, do you believe I can do this? As we encounter people in the world around us in need of healing, I think there's so much freedom in the way that Jesus frames this for us. And so I think our best tactic is to say, I don't know everything about healing. I know that God can heal you. <laughs> so let's see if God's going to do this today. Let's see if, this, if we can get something to happen today. And then we pray, we ask God to show us what we need to see. If there's an obstacle, if they need to forgive someone, if there's some sin going on, if there's some sort of barrier, whatever the case might be, God can show us how to, how to operate in that situation. So um, that's, that's what we can think about in terms of practically how can we implement this the way that Jesus did. Because I think we're, we're still on mission. We're, we still should see healing. We should, still should see the power of God in operation. Now, on the flip side of that coin, I know that some of us know the right answer to this question, that the answer is yes, but still feel unsure in, in your hearts. And I understand that. I can tell you I've been there. And my invitation to you this morning is just not to give up, to not limit God based on our own experiences. If you go through life praying for everyone you meet and only a few of them, maybe one or two of them are healed before the kingdom of God, I still think that that's worth it. It's still worth the disappointment. It's still worth the anguish. It's still worth the doubt. It's still worth all of those things to continue to pray for people, even if something immediate doesn't happen. And so that's what I want to point out again. And we talked about this again a couple months ago, but this is not on us. The pressure is not on us. It's not our power or ability that can heal people. It's God's power. I wanted to close with a story. Um, one of my friends, Garrett Bova, is a pastor in the Chicago area, and he was talking about a conference he went to back in 2016 uh, in South Africa. And the conference was on the power of God, manifesting the power of God, and, and healing people and that sort of a thing. And, and he, he was at this conference, and they, they broke into smaller groups. They broke into groups of like four or five. And so he was with these three women that he didn't know, and they were to get in a little circle, and they were to pray about you know, going out and ministering to some people. And so one of them got a vision of a group of buildings. And one of them got a vision of this like Paisley pattern. And so they were like, okay, let's just hop in the car and let's see if we can find these group of buildings. So they're, they're driving around South Africa, Johannesburg, I think. And they don't, none of them know, they're not from South Africa. None of them know where they're going. They're just driving around, like just trying to figure it out. And then the young lady that had the vision about the building, she sees the buildings. She's like, whoa, those are the buildings. And it's a hospital. They're like, oh, this is super cool. We're going to see a physical healing. So they get, they get out of the car. They're walking around, and they're just like looking around. And then my buddy Garrett, I think he's the one who noticed the woman with the paisley like pattern dress. He's like, is that the pattern that you saw the vision of? He was turning to one of the other ladies. And she said, yeah, that's the exact pattern. So they walk up to her, and they start talking to her. And they, she doesn't speak English very well, but thankfully her granddaughter is there, and she can interpret. And so they're like having this conversation. They're like, you know, we really feel led to come talk to you today. And, and, you know, we, we were believing for, to, to minister to someone, to see someone get healed, you know, all this stuff, right? And, and she's just, like, confused. She's like, I, I, don't, I don't know anyone. And then she's like, well, my daughter's in the hospital. You can pray for her. So they, they pray for the daughter in the hospital. And um, they, ask, they ask the lady over and over again, like, is there anything we, else we can do? And she's like, no, no, no. And so they move on. They get back in their car. They start driving away. And then they all have this, like, uneasy feeling that, like, no, there's more. So they, they go back, park the car, they go back to, and they find the woman again. And they go, they're like, are you really sure? Like, is there nothing going on in your life? Is there nothing we can pray for, for you, specifically for you, the, you know, this woman? And she's like, no. And then the granddaughter like elbows her. And she's like, well, I have this ear that's bad. <laughs> I can't hear in my right ear. And they're like, oh, well, we can pray for that. And so they, one of them put, puts one of their hands on her ear and they, they pray for her and nothing really happens. And so then they try it again, and then she hears like a pop, you know, she's starting to sort of cry, she hears like a popping, crackling sound. So then they pray for her again, and then 
it completely dislodges. And she's like, I can hear straight through. You know, again, her English is very broken. She goes straight through, straight through. I can hear straight through. So they ministered to this woman's ear, and she was completely delivered. And I don't know the rest of the story. I don't know if this woman was a Christian or not. I don't know if she came to Christ later or not. Or the, what the end of the story is, but what I do know is God still works in people to see deliverances and healings today. He still does work. And it's not, it's not like we can just go find the bones of a dead holy man and like throw dead bodies onto those bones and expect them to get up from the dead. We can't make a recipe out of that either. None of these cakes in the Bible are going to be duplicated exactly the same way in our own lives, our own walks. And that's why it's so important that we walk by the Spirit of God. We ask for him to show us what we can do. So where does that leave us? Where do we, how do we apply this today? I want you to take a minute and fill in the blank. I want Jesus to heal blank. I want Jesus to heal blank. Some of us, it might be more obvious. You know, Diane and her leg. It's like, Diane may want her to, Jesus to heal her leg. Diane may have a different answer. I don't know. I'm not putting Diane on the spot right now. That's not the point. The point is, maybe it's a physical issue that you're struggling with. Maybe, uh, maybe it is something like Diane's leg, where it's like, you know, I'd like my, my leg to be better. Maybe it's a negative mental pattern. Uh, maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you want Jesus to heal your, your marriage. Maybe you want him to heal your relationship with your parents, or you want him to heal your relationship with your kids, or, or maybe one of your friends that you've been estranged from, or something like that. Maybe you want Jesus to heal some past trauma that you've had that you haven't fully processed yet. Maybe that's what you want healing from. So who do you go to for this kind of healing? Whatever issue you've identified, who should we go to for this kind of healing? And again, what I'm trying to point out is there is no recipe for receiving deliverance. You know, uh, many times, whatever thing you thought of is complicated enough that yes, certainly God can do anything immediately, but frequently it takes time for things to fall into place, especially if you're, you want Jesus to heal a relationship with someone, that's going to take time, likely. You know, this conversation, that conversation, these prayers, and, and this kind of movement in your heart, and this kind of movement in their heart, and that's going to take time to develop. But the one universal thing that I can say this morning, the only thing that all these recipes have in common is, is that the only thing that can heal whatever it is that you want healed is the power of God through Jesus our Lord. That's the, that's the thing. That's the universal thing. So yes, some of us have doubts and questions. Um, perhaps you do too. But today, the question is not, what's the laundry list of things? The question is not, how is this going to happen? The question is not, you know, why is God not doing this right now? The question is, do you believe that Jesus is able to heal? Where are you going to go? We're going to go to God our Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we're going to go. And I think keeping it that simple can help us, can help us walk the direction that we need to walk and see the deliverance that we need to see. And so I think he can heal. I think Jesus can heal. And I hope as you work through this in your own life, uh, that you'll see that that's true too. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for um, just your great grace and mercy to uh, all of humanity that you've uh, provided us with so many different examples of healing. You've, you've shown your power in so many different ways. And uh, even your son Jesus, all the dynamic things that he did, um, how varied it was, how different it was, how all these circumstances were different, how your power was able to work uh, no matter what the circumstances were, Father. And um, we, we want to grow in our trust and our faith in you and your power and your ability uh, through Jesus, your Son. And so, Father, we, we ask you for healing in all these different categories of life, for uh, physical healing, for mental and emotional healing, uh, for spiritual healing, for healing from traumas, for um, healing of relationships, whatever the case might be, Father, that we can just keep it simple and know that you're the one we come to. We come running to you through your son, Jesus, that that's, that's as simple as it can be. And Father, we will do our best to leave our doubts and our concerns and our questions um, to the side, but we also know that you can overcome all of those, that that's not a limit for you, 
that your grace and mercy extends even beyond our doubts and our concerns. So, Father, we thank you for your goodness this morning and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.